Worship seems to be a basic aspect of the Christian faith. Almost all church services will include a time of song and praise. In most cases, it takes place around 10 a.m. on a Sunday morning, perhaps in the form of four or five songs before a speaker replaces the band and talks for an hour. Sometimes worship can be an incredible time to go closer to the Lord in song or prayer. Or sometimes worship can seem like nothing more than an emotional high, a time to feel closer to God, and then move on. Let's look at what worship should truly look like. Growing up, I was exposed to formal worship settings on a regular basis. Not only was I raised in church, but my parents often served in worship ministry. My mom would play the keys and would sing, and my dad often played percussion and trumpet. And in seeing their example of worship, up close and personal, I naturally began to develop a strong desire to follow in their footsteps. As I got into high school, I helped establish a youth worship band in my church, which only continued to fuel my desire to worship the Lord. I ended up serving not only in youth, but in Sunday morning services and in a couple how-to life events in my area. After all of this life experience, I thought I had worship pretty well figured out, especially for someone my age. I thought all of the services I attended, all of the bands I was in, brought me to an understanding of what it truly meant to worship. But then something changed. I began to notice that after the song ends, after the moment passes, after the instruments are put away, I stopped worshiping. The band goes home, my mom hides her ivory keys, dad puts away his trumpet, the fire goes out, the music dies, and so does the euphoria of worshiping the Lord. This really messed with me. I knew that singing praises to the Lord was what we were called to do. I knew that it was our responsibility as his creation to bring glory to his name. I knew that I was following the formula correctly. Why then did the one hour I spent praising the Lord feel so superficial when compared to the other 167 hours of the week? Why did worship create the spiritual high that died as soon as the song did? I was at the pinnacle of where someone my age and of my limited talent could be in worship ministry, but I had no way to answer my question. I wrestled with this for weeks on end. This question began to belittle the, at one time, super strong desire I had to lead others into worship. I began to feel less fulfilled during any set, song, or setting. No song sounded right, no set of tunes flowed together, no combination of instruments struck the right note. I grew bitter towards serving God in the area he had called me to. Worship had lost its wonder. Maybe you have been in church your whole life, but worship songs and services have lost their luster. Or maybe they never even interested you in the first place. Let's look into the Word and see how God views worship and how He interacts with His people. In Romans 12, Paul talks about a true act of worship. Romans 12, 1 reads, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Paul is appealing, pleading, with his fellow Christians in Rome to surrender themselves as a living sacrifice unto the Lord, and that this is what defines spiritual worship. Notice Paul doesn't say, I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your songs to the Lord, to present your voices up to the Lord, to present your arms up to the Lord. Paul pleads that we present ourselves to the Lord, our whole self, and that this defines true worship. Not that our songs, our voices are unpleasing to the Lord, in fact, he delights when we sing his praises. But music should not be the catalyst for worship. Surrendering ourselves, our lives, unto the Lord should always be at the core of our worship to him. Paul is hardly the only man of God who addresses this concept. The prophet Isaiah had an encounter with God that led him to the same conclusion of surrender, while simultaneously setting up a complete, beautiful format for worship. Isaiah was a prophet of the Lord to the people of Israel, in the sixth chapter of his writings, he chronicles an encounter with God, one that changed him forever. Isaiah 6, 1, 8 reads, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one said to another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. At the start, Isaiah tells us that this vision came to him during the year that King Uzziah died. His death 
marked the end of an era of prosperity for the Jewish people. This was the year that everything changed, a time where the people wanted to hear from the Lord. We too often seek the Lord in the midst of change. Then Isaiah sets up the scene of a holy throne room full of examples of God's glory and raw awesomeness. The train of the robe of the Lord filled the whole temple. The angels sang so loudly and with such awe, it shakes the foundations beneath their feet. In the midst of this powerful scene, Isaiah responds. And I said, woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. When Isaiah is presented with God's presence, notice his response. He realizes his unworthiness. He says, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips. Isaiah is a major spokesperson for the Lord to the Jewish people. And even he cannot deny his own sin. He knows he cannot atone for his brokenness on his own. But just as the Lord forgives us for our sins through the blood of Jesus, the Lord forgives Isaiah, exemplified by the coal touching Isaiah's lips. His guilt is taken away, his sin is atoned for. Now through this whole experience, the Lord only speaks once. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. In the end, he only asks one question. The Lord asks, Whom shall I send? and who will go for us. And then, after experiencing the presence of the Lord, after seeing his majesty, after receiving his forgiveness, Isaiah has one response. Here I am, send me. This passage sets up for us what worship should be. It's not an hour, not a song, not a service. Isaiah shows us worship is a lifestyle. Worshiping the Lord is recognizing his awesomeness, his glory, his majesty, just as Isaiah did. Worship is repenting for our sin, our transgressions, our lawlessness, just as Isaiah did. Worship is responding to God's call, His command, His commission, just as Isaiah did. Sometimes, worship can hold the most incredible, ground-shaking moments of our lives. But if you only go into worship expecting some spiritual high, I hate to break it to you, but you're missing the point. And if you have gotten to the point where Sunday morning worship doesn't bring you closer to God, I think you've realized that. Worship should first and foremost be centered around God, around bringing Him glory, about humbling ourselves before His righteousness. And honestly, most of us probably get to that point, but often miss the next crucial step, noticing our sin and compared to His majesty. When Isaiah sat in front of the Lord, before the Lord even spoke a word, Isaiah was broken. Isaiah's response was, woe is me. He repented of his sin. As we are humbled and in awe before the Lord, he speaks to us. He doesn't pat Isaiah on the head. He doesn't say, wow, I'm so glad you found me. He asks, who will go? Who will tell others about me? Who will tell those who do not know the Lord? Worship should end with a call to follow the Lord and his will for your life. God doesn't set us up on the mountain for us to stay there. He places us up on the mountain to prepare us to go in to the valley. In the end, Isaiah's response was this, Here I am, send me. Here I am, in awe of your glory, Lord. Here I am, broken before you, God. Here I am, ready to follow your will for my life. Here I am, this is my worship. Hey everybody, my name is Joshua with the How to Life Movement. Thank you so much for watching. Make sure to subscribe to the channel and download the How to Life app. If you have any questions about anything you heard in this video today, you can message us on Instagram at HowToLifeMovement. Thank you so much for watching.